Okay, so today we're going to be thinking about Tilly Olson's I Stand Here Ironing. Before we get into I Stand Here Ironing, you know, what I would like us to do is, is just to think back about some of the other first person uh, narrations we've read so far this semester. So if we think about Everyday Use on 469, if we think about Uncle Ben's Choice on page 3, uh, what you pawn, I will redeem, and a number of others. Maybe Sonny's Blues is the most appropriate, but there's others as well. We might say that when we look at a first-person narration, we have a unique opportunity to talk about tone, by which, again, to define the term, it's the relationship, uh, the evident relationship between the narrator and a subject or subjects that the narrator is focusing on, discussing, and describing. And in I Stand Here Ironing, what we have is essentially a short story that all involves this mother reflecting on the life of her daughter uh, as it's developed so far from very, very challenging, you know, a very, very challenging period after the birth of her daughter to her daughter's eventual kind of coming into her own, finding her own personality, excelling in ways that are meaningful to her. So it kind of follows that that early period in this young woman's life. And as we ask ourselves about the, uh, the mother's tone, okay, so what is her evident kind of relationship or emotional connection to her daughter? And we might ask ourselves a couple of questions. The first question we might ask is just simply, you know, is there a tone that we can define? Okay. And then we might ask ourselves, does that tone um, uh, how, how complicated is that tone? Is it a superficial tone? Is it a tone that's multifaceted, has various dimensions to it? That would be question two. Question three is, you know, does the tone change over the course of the story? These are all fundamental questions that we might ask. And to get some way to think about how we might approach those questions and begin to address them, we might look at stories that we've read before. So if we go back to everyday use, right, on 469, the story that we started this class with, we might um, ask ourselves about Mama's relationship with D and whether or not that tone changes over the course of the story. Now, most of us would probably argue that over the course of that story that her relationship does indeed change with her daughter as she's describing her. As we go from the very early passages in that story where she's uh, she seems to be quite nervous about meeting her daughter and is very you know earnest about wanting to be the best uh, be the way her daughter wants her to be to at the end of the story when we see her very clearly kind of standing up to D and you know giving Maggie the um, uh, the inherited items you know the quilts uh, that um, that D wanted so her tone her relationship with her daughter seems to change over the course of the story and it goes from one of kind of subservience or kind of fear to one of addressing her as as an equal right or addressing her as as her daughter right there are probably various ways to describe that but we can notice how that relationship changes over the course of the story and then there's a number of factors we might address how and why the relationship changes what are the key details what are the key moments we don't need to get into that right now but if we think about that that idea of tone and let's take it to a, let's take it to another story that we've read, like uh, James Baldwin's Sonny's Blues, right? Which we read very early on in this course, where we have these two brothers growing up in Harlem. Um, one of them kind of makes his life as a teacher. The other uh, runs into some trouble with the law, runs into some trouble um, after he gets out of the military, and then eventually goes on to become a jazz musician, blues musician. Excuse me, uh, I said jazz there for a second. Um, we might notice how the brothers' relationship changes over the course of the story and how it is our narrator comes to see Sonny, right? And if we think about that story in the opening passages and the opening opening pages, Sonny is kind of this persistent problem, you know, he has to be told by his mother that he has to be responsible for Sonny, he doesn't want to be, and they have all of the, 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 the conflicts, the fights leading up to the moment when our narrator suddenly seems to understand who Sonny is and appreciates him for who he is. And at that moment, we sense there's this shift in tone. There's this shift in the relationship. Probably the clearest example of a tonal shift um, in terms of a first-person narration, arguably, that we've read so far would come from Cathedral, right? Raymond Carver's Cathedral, where, as I discussed yesterday, 
we have this sense of, or the previous module, uh, depending upon when you're watching this, um, we have this sense of the narrator um, being very dismissive of the blind man who's coming to visit, and then at the end of the story, they come together in this moment of, we'll call it mutual respect, uh, or at least he seems to suddenly respect uh, Robert in ways that he didn't earlier in the story. So again, we notice the shift in tone there. Now, it is all also the case that we might think about um, tonal shifts in a number of other stories that we've read this semester, but one of the things we might point out, one of the things we might note right now, is how significant these shifts are to particularly the first person narrations that we've read, okay? And how, how often it is the case that these stories depend upon our narrator coming to describe or experience the world in a different way or another person in a different way. And if you go back through our stories and you check off the first person narration, um, what you will see is it's very often the case that stories that are told with first person are, you know, sometimes they're dramatic in the sense that major events happen that transform the characters, but usually along the way or part of that, what we get is a tonal shift with regards to the narrator's relationship with one or more characters in the story. And when we think about I stand here ironing, the question we might ask ourselves is, is there a tonal shift here? It's a complicated story. Not, not in the sense that it tells a very convoluted tale, because it doesn't. It's, it's very straightforward. But one of the questions that we might ask is, you know, can we slap a you know pretty clear you know adjective or some other descriptor on the story to describe the narrator's relationship with her daughter. Um, you know, we can say that she loves her daughter, which I think is probably pretty evident and not a very controversial thing to say, but, you know, there's never a moment in the story where the narrator just says something like, oh, I love my daughter just so much, right? Um, or, or, or I just cared about her more than anything in the world. What we have to do is infer that, and I think it's pretty easy to infer, but what we have to do is infer that from the details the narrator gives us along the way, right? So the narrator, you know, has to leave her daughter with a, a woman in the apartment building where she lives, and when she returns home, she runs up the stairs to see her at the end of the day. You know, that kind of detail tells us that the narrator, you know, is, you know, it really bothers her to be separated from her daughter. It's not something that she takes any kind of pride in, and she only feels better when she's with her daughter, we see how she's very aware that the separation she has from her daughter leads to all kinds of anxiety uh, on the part of the daughter and how desperate and unable she is to do anything else for her than what she is doing because she has no support, right? There's no, there's no one else in the family to help support her. There's no you know, government assistance to help support her. She has to make these really difficult decisions in order to have somebody be there to care for her daughter. So when we think about tone, you know, tone can be, and we'll, I'll use two new words here uh, that are both both worth knowing. You've probably encountered them before. Tone can be explicit. The relationship between the narrator and the subject can be explicit. Something as simple as, you know, I don't like that person, right? Or I like that person. Uh, very obvious, very straightforward. Or it can be implicit, okay? Or something that has to be inferred from the reading, which means that we have to essentially read between the lines and we have to ask ourselves, you know, how and why is somebody saying something and what's the larger significance of what they're saying? For example, when we look at the story, I Stand Here Ironing, why don't we go to page 389, top of 389, this is the daughter, a little bit later in life, talking to her mother. Aren't you ever going to finish the ironing, mother? Whistler painted his mother in a rocker. I'd have to paint mine standing over an ironing board. Okay, so it's just this little comment from the daughter, right? Um, a little bit later in life, and she's giving her a hard time about the fact that she's still ironing, uh, that she's still doing this kind of domestic labor, right? Uh, why doesn't she just stop? Why doesn't she just relax? And what the daughter, you know, maybe isn't able to be aware of here is that this woman's entire life, right, has been focused on working on, you know, on, on, on making sure that her daughter has the most that can be given to her in spite of the circumstances that the mother finds herself in. 
So when I when I when I hear a comment like that from the daughter, you know, why are you always ironing? You know, how can I use that detail to support a larger argument about the tone of the story, or perhaps the shifting tone of the story, or the tone of the story at that moment? So we need to be able to express with some specificity what we think the author's, or the narrator, excuse me, uh, relationship is with any given subject. In this case, Emily. Or we might also think about the tone of Emily and her relationship with her mother. What can we infer about you know, how she might feel about her mother? A little bit more challenging to do that because this story is told from the perspective of the mother. Let's back up a little bit now and think about where we are in terms of the class, where we are in terms of the writing for the class, where we are in terms of developing as writers in the course. We're all very aware that when we write about a story, really write about any subject in an academic context, we always have to make a claim. That claim needs to be followed with evidence, and the evidence then needs to be explained. When we think about that structure, what we need to really figure out is, well, what's the best evidence I can use to support my claim? Okay, so if I'm going to argue that the mother in I Stand Here Ironing you know, um, loves her daughter very much and speaks of her with a tone of reverence and respect, okay, I would have to then figure out if there are any details in the story that support that claim. Now, it's very possible that when I start looking through the story, I might say, hey, wait a minute, there really isn't much in here about reverence and respect. Um, what do I do now? And this is the moment where a student is going to make either a good decision or a bad decision. And the bad decision is this. I will find any piece of evidence I can, and I will just throw it in there, and I'll just claim it supports my point. That produces bad writing. The better decision is to say, well, there's not much in here that shows the mother's reverence for her daughter, as far as I can see, so my claim probably isn't that good. I need to go back and revisit it, revise it, redraft it, so that whatever I'm saying is something I can support. The mother expresses a tone of desperation when describing her daughter's early life. Ah, now I can find all kinds of evidence in the story. There's all kinds of details that show the mother's desperation, right? You know, fighting to help her daughter come back uh, because she's losing weight and she doesn't have much to lose in the home that she's living in, racing up the stairs to be with her daughter, the sadness she expresses at having to leave her daughter with another family, tending to her daughter when she's sick. There's all kinds of things in here that might relate to desperation. Okay, I can say there's a tone of desperation here, but now I also need to recognize that it's not just any old detail that I want to pick. I want to pick a detail that really shows the desperation and that I can, I can go on to explain how and why it shows desperation. Okay, so I don't want to be in a situation where I say something like, there is a tone of desperation in, I stand here ironing when the narrator talks about her daughter. We see this tone when she describes the conditions of the foster home where her daughter lives. If I say that, then I need to then describe those conditions and talk about how those conditions suggest the tone of desperation. I need to do that work. I can't just jump into something else, right? I can't just say something like, we also see this desperation when she runs up the stairs and we see this desperation when she takes her daughter to the hospital. If I do that, what I'm doing is I'm just kind of hurling evidence at you, okay? And I'm not actually taking the time to say, here's my claim, here's my evidence, and now I'm going to explain in my own words, in several sentences, the specific rationale that indicates how and why this evidence supports my claim, okay? If I, if I don't do that, if I just slip into other evidence, the reader has no reason to believe me. 
Because what I haven't done is I haven't defended anything, right? We can't just make a claim, throw a piece of evidence at it, and then throw a bunch more evidence at the reader without taking the time to get them from point A to point B to point C. You have to explain that. That's kind of fundamental communication. If we don't do that, we're making a rhetorical mistake. And the mistake would be simply asserting our own ethos. And what, what I mean by that is we're writing in such a way that suggests that I can say whatever I want to say because I know I'm right. That doesn't work. Um, it might work in your own head, but it doesn't work when you're trying to persuade somebody else because they're going to be listening to what you're saying and they're going to be saying, I don't know, uh, uh, that might be true, that might not be true. If this person can't explain to me why they're right, then why should I believe them? I'm not going to believe them just because that's their opinion. That's, that's meaningless in a professional environment, right? You have to be able to substantiate what you say, explain what you mean, go into good detail. So when we, so we think about a story like, I stand here ironing. It, it's an interesting example of the relevance of tone to storytelling. So the whole point of the story is for us to think about the mother's relationship with her subject, which is her daughter, right? Her first daughter, primarily. Um, and then we realize that we need to then express that in some way that is, you know, makes sense to the reader. And to do that, we always need to take the time to get really detailed about the evidence that we use, which means that we need to select the best evidence. We can't grab any old piece of evidence. How do we do that? Well, we might think about a couple of things. We might think about the significance of outlining before we start to write. So I know I wanna say this, where can I find the evidence in the story to support it? And if I say, well, you know, there's only one instance in the story where this happens, and it kind of happens as an aside, maybe I'm not making the best point. Maybe there's a better point a larger, more significant point, a point with a better example that is more detail that I can then draw from in my explanation. If I start thinking about it that way, I will probably produce writing that is far superior to writing that doesn't do that. Okay, and so that's what I want you to keep in mind when you're working with this story, when you're working with a writing prompt for this story, are you making specific claims, are you using good solid evidence in support of them, and then are you taking the time to explain in detail what that evidence means before you start dragging in other examples? Because there's really no need for the other examples in terms of the paragraph structure we're using in this course. Claim, evidence, explanation. Six to eight sentences. If you can do that consistently, you will be on a very good track for keeping your thoughts organized, for being persuasive, and for meeting the challenges that we set out for you in terms of writing uh, as part of your university career, okay? So I would just have you think a little bit about that. As you hopefully enjoy I Stand Here Ironing, it's a very nice story. Um, it's, it's not a very dramatic story, but it gives us a lot of good insight into the struggles um, of this young woman and her family. Um, and that relates to a number of other topics we've considered this term. I'm not going to go into them in this video because the video would then go on for 40 minutes. Uh, but at this point in the course, we should be at a point where we are starting to become quite capable on our own of understanding how the individuals represented in this anthology and in the story relate to the larger concerns of the class. So I'll kind of leave you with that. Okay, so hope you enjoy the story. And as always, I look forward to seeing what it is you write about it.